Welcome to Budget MTG Decks. It's all magic fun, all cards under a dollar. I'm David, and today we're going to learn how static abilities work. Now, static abilities are abilities which are always in effect, and are often found on creatures. Well, magic is quite a complicated game, so we're actually not going to look at all the abilities that are, can be found in a magic game. Just a few of the more common ones. And it's also important to note that magic has one golden rule, and that states that cards allow us to break the normal rule. So when they contradict with the cards, the cards always win. Let's start by looking at an ability called Haste. A creature with Haste may attack and tap on the same turn it comes in. This overrides the normal rule of Summoning Sickness, which states that creatures may not do this. An example of a creature with Haste is Raging Goblin. As you can see in the ability section, Raging Goblin has Haste, and so can attack and tap on the turn it comes in. If we continue where we left off the last video, we see that it's our opponent's turn. They untap and draw a card. During their first main phase, they play a mountain. Now, a mountain is a type of land which only produces red mana. They tap the land and they play Raging Goblin, which has a casting cost of one red mana. In their combat phase, they declare both their Raging Goblin and their Runeclaw Bear as attacking by tapping them. Notice how the Goblin is allowed to attack even though it came in this turn. That's because it has haste. Now it's our turn to declare blockers. Unfortunately, we cannot use our Glory Seeker to block, as it is tapped. When a card is tapped, it means it has been used for the turn, and so can't be used again. For example, a land which is tapped can't be tapped again for more mana, and a creature which is tapped can't be used to attack or to block. In this case, Glory Seeker is tapped, so we can't use it to block, and we take 3 points of damage. 1 damage from the Raging Goblin, and 2 damage from the Rune Claw Bear. Now we can move on to flying. A creature with flying can only be blocked by other creatures with flying, or reach. Essentially, a creature with flying flies over your opponent's creatures, so they cannot block them. But it is important to note that a creature with flying may still block creatures with or without flying. An example of a creature with flying is Suntail Hawk. As we see here, flying states that this creature can't be blocked, except by creatures with flying, or reach. Let's look at a different scenario. In this case, we already had our Suntail Hawk since the beginning of the turn, so it doesn't suffer from summoning sickness. Our opponent has a Rune Claw Bear. In our combat phase, we declare our Suntail Hawk as attacking, and our opponent may declare blockers. However, since the Rune Claw Bear does not have flying or reach, it can't block our Suntail Hawk, and our opponent takes one point of damage. If the role would have been reversed and it was the Rune Claw Bear attacking us, we would have been allowed to use our Sun Tail Hawk to block the bear. Reach is up next. A creature with Reach can block creatures with flying. Basically, they don't have flying themselves, but do have the capability to intercept flyers. An example of a creature with Reach is Canopy Spider. As we see here, this creature can block creatures with flying. Let's look at the last scenario again. But this time, our opponent has a Canopy Spider instead of a Rune Claw Bear. We again foolishly declare our Suntail Hawk to attack, and our opponent may declare blockers. This time, our opponent declares the Canopy Spider to block our Flyer, as it has reach. The Suntail Hawk deals 1 point of damage to the Canopy Spider, and the Canopy Spider simultaneously deals 1 point of damage to our Suntail Hawk. Our Hawk does not survive the Spider's web and is put into our graveyard. Now we can have a look at Vigilance. A creature with Vigilance does not tap when it attacks. Normally, when we declare attackers, we tap them. Since creatures with Vigilance don't tap when attacking, we simply push them a little bit forward to show that they are attacking. The benefit of having a creature with Vigilance is that we can use it to attack, and then in our opponent's turn, we can use it to block. An example of a creature with Vigilance is Steadfast Guard. As we see here, attacking does not cause this creature to tap. Let's look at a different scenario. This is where we already had Steadfast Guard since the beginning of our turn, and our opponent has a Raging Goblin. We are in our combat phase right now, and we declare Steadfast Guard to attack. Notice how we do not tap Steadfast Guard when attacking. Now our opponent may block. They declare the Raging Goblin to block the Steadfast Guard. Now, damage is resolved simultaneously. The Goblin does 1 point of damage to the Steadfast Guard, and the Steadfast Guard does 2 points of damage to the Raging Goblin. Notice that even though the Goblin only has one point of toughness, the Steadfast Guard is still fully blocked and must do its complete two points of damage to the Goblin, even though one point of damage would have been enough to kill this one toughness creature. Okay, let's move on to Trample. 
When a creature with trample gets blocked, if it deals enough damage to destroy the blockers, you may assign the remaining damage to the defending player. So basically, a creature with trample can trample over smaller creatures and still damage your opponent. An example of a creature with trample is Garruk's Companion. As we see here, trample allows this creature to assign the rest of the damage to your opponent once enough damage is dealt to destroy the blockers. Let's pretend for a moment our opponent already had a Garruk's Companion since the last turn and it's now their combat phase. They declare Garruk's Companion to attack by tapping it. Now we may block and we decide to do so with our Steadfast Guard. Steadfast Guard deals 2 points of damage to Garruk's Companion. However, Garruk's Companion does not deal its 3 points of damage to Steadfast Guard. This is because it has trampled, so it deals 2 points of damage to Steadfast Guard, because that's sufficient to destroy it, and the remaining 1 point of damage to us. Now we can have a look at Lifelink. When a creature with Lifelink deals damage, you gain that much life. So, very simply, when a creature with lifelink deals damage to a creature or a player, you will gain the same amount of life as the damage dealt. An example of a creature with lifelink is Child of Night. Child of Night has a casting cost of 2 mana, 1 mana of any color, and 1 black mana. Black mana is produced by a type of land called Swamp. As we see here, lifelink states that damage dealt by this creature also causes you to gain that much life. Let's look at a different scenario this time. Here, our opponent has a Runeclaw Bear, and we have a Child of Night. It's our combat phase, and we declare Child of Night to attack. Our opponent decides to block with the Runeclaw Bear. Now, damage is resolved simultaneously. The Bear does 2 points of damage to the Child of Night, and the Child of Night does 2 points of damage to the Bear. This also causes us to gain 2 points of life. Notice how such life gain can yield us more than our starting life total. Both creatures took enough damage to destroy them, and they're put into our graveyard. Let's proceed with Death Touch. A creature with Death Touch is so deadly, it only needs to do one point of damage to another creature to destroy it, regardless of its toughness. An example of a creature with Death Touch is Typhoid Rats. As we see here, Death Touch states that any amount of damage this deals to a creature is enough to destroy it. Let's pretend for a moment that it's our opponent's combat phase, and they already had a Rumbling Bailoth, and we have a Typhoid Rats. They declare the Rumbling Bailoth to attack, and we decide to block with our Typhoid Rats. Now damage gets resolved simultaneously. The Rumbling Bailoth deals 4 points of damage to the Typhoid Rats, which is enough to kill it as it's only a 1 toughness creature. At the same time, the Typhoid Rats deal 1 point of Death Touch damage to the Rumbling Bailoth. Now normally a creature would have to deal at least 4 points of damage in order to kill this 4 toughness creature. However, as this damage is Death Touch, it kills the Rumbling Bailoth and the creatures are put into our graveyards. Now let's have a look at First Strike. A creature with First Strike is so fast it deals damage before other creatures get a chance to hit back. So instead of all damage being resolved simultaneously, the creature with First Strike deals damage first. An example of a creature with First Strike is Youthful Knight. As we see here, it states that this creature deals combat damage before creatures without First Strike. Let's pretend it's our combat phase, and we already had a Youthful Knight. They had a Rune Claw Bear. We declare Youthful Knight as attacking, and our opponent decides to block with their Rune Claw Bear. Now damage is not dealt simultaneously. First, the Youthful Knight deals 2 points of damage to the Rune Claw Bear, which is enough to destroy it, and it gets put into our opponent's graveyard. Then, it's time for creatures without first strike to deal damage. As the Rune Claw Bear is already dead, it cannot hit back, and our Youthful Knight survives. Now we have looked at a couple of the more common static abilities. I'm David, and this was Budget MTG Dex. Join us next time as we have a look at a new type of card, Enchantment.